Hello, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Digging for Answers, Uncovering the Mysteries of the Florida Burrowing Owl with Zoe Bonerbo, Hawk Mountain Education and Conservation Science trainee from autumn 2019, as well as education trainee from summer 2018. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and joining me is Dr. J.F. Terrien, Hawk Mountain's Senior Scientist and Graduate Studies Director. Hi, guys. We are so glad that you all are joining us today. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, a huge thank you. We simply could not do what we do without your support. If you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during this time of COVID crisis. And we're thrilled to offer our community a variety of free educational virtual programs. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates any donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform, and we designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we're so excited that Zoe Bonerbo is joining us today all the way from sunny Florida uh, to teach us some secrets of the burrowing owl. And I'd like to share some of Zoe's background experience with our audience. Zoe graduated last year from McGill University in Montreal, Canada with a bachelor's in environmental biology and a specialization in wildlife biology. As an undergraduate, she volunteered at the McGill Bird Observatory for four years, learning about migration monitoring and bird banding. She has also worked as a volunteer with Shades of Hope Wildlife Rehabilitation Center and as a naturalist with Animal Tales Education Programs. At Hawk Mountain, she has completed two traineeships, advancing her skills in raptor conservation and education. Currently, Zoe is working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to survey burrowing owls across the state. And personally, I'd like to add that I was very impressed, Zoe, uh, with your versatility uh, during your traineeship. Uh, you have such a strong science background and you're such an engaging and dynamic educator, great at facilitating team building activities, and also um, a very good canoeing instructor. And Zoe actually led one of our birding by boat events at Leaster Lake, a canoe trip for our uh, Wild Women on the Mountain series. So a very talented lady indeed. Zoe, I have to ask, how did you get so involved in the world of raptors? <laughs> well, thank you so much for that introduction, Jamie. Um, I grew up in New York City of all places, so not where you would ever expect there to be a lot of wildlife, but I grew up allergic to cats and dogs and I absolutely loved animals, so I naturally gravitated towards birds because even in the middle of a dense urban city, you still have birds everywhere. Um, so then by the time I got to college, um, like you mentioned, I volunteered with the McGill Bird Observatory, which which was a great opportunity to start really learning about the research and science behind birding and ornithology. Um, and I was really captivated, especially by um, the owl banding program that they had there, and um, also the raptors that we would occasionally catch um, in the mist nets. So from there, I was able and fortunate enough to get a traineeship with Hawk Mountain, where um, Hawk Mountain really gave me that baseline framework um, in order to continue working with raptors, which I absolutely fell in love with. So. Wonderful, thanks for sharing that, Zoe. And from, you had two different traineeships um, at Hawk Mountain, and from all of your experiences at Hawk Mountain, what has helped you the most with your current work doing field uh, science research on owls? Um, I think part of it was the diversity of the work that I got to 
to do with Hawk Mountain. So I was assisting with education programs, with the migration count, um, being able to go out in the field and do, do surveys and um, banding. So the education component comes in really heavily when you work with the government, when you work with private landowners um, in order to help ensure conservation efforts. Um, and then on top of that, the migration monitoring um, just simply gives you that baseline foundation for how to conduct research, um, how to follow a set protocol, um, and those basic needs. And then in addition to that, having the opportunity to be able to go out into the field and actually practice some banding, actually um, get to practice ID in other ways um, is very beneficial for developing and honing the fine skills of the craft, so. Thank you. So Zoe, the girl from New York, how did you end up down in Florida studying burrowing owls? Um, so I uh, am working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, which is a governmental organization. So um, this position I actually applied for last October and I had found it on the Texas A&M Fisheries and Wildlife Job Board, which a uh, great resource for anybody out there who's looking for wildlife work. Um, and because they're a government organization, things tend to move a little slowly. So I wasn't contacted until almost six months later, but um, almost six months later, they, they asked if I would like to do an interview. Um, and and I was able to interview for the position and they felt that based on my background, my skills and qualification would be really beneficial. So I had about two weeks to get down to Florida um, and start this job position in March. So, Wow, that's so exciting, Zoe, and what an amazing opportunity for you. We are all psyched to learn more about this research you're doing, so I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, great. So I have a PowerPoint here. I'm going to share my screen. So I have been working with the Florida Burrowing Owl. Can you guys see that okay? It should come up full screen here. Looks great. Great. All right. Um, so just as a forward note, um, unless otherwise noted, the photos were taken by me. So none of these photos are off the internet. And if I did take somebody else's photo, it's uh, credited to them with their permission. So um, so burrowing owls, let's talk about them a little bit. They are found throughout North and Central America, um, primarily on the Western side. So they are partial migrant species there, meaning that you have part of the population that is migrating south in the winter and north in the spring. Um, and then another section of the population that are residents and they stay where they are year round. Um, we do have a residential population in Florida, which is the only population over on the east coast of the Americas. Um, and so you can see on the map on the right there, um, some of the points of uh, burrowing owl locations that were known prior to 2013. So the, that map was created in 2013 of sightings that had been posted on sites like eBird um, and surveys that had been done back then. Um, so the most of the clusters, the larger clusters you see are along the coastlines there. So in a little bit more urban areas um, in Marco Island, in Cape Coral, and then along Broward County there. Um, and there are a couple of other points that are scattered throughout central Florida in more rural areas. So I'm located right about there at a place called Archibald Biological Station. Um, so we are working out of this point because it is centralized to a lot of the owl locations. Um, and I just want to preface that um, me and my coworker Eden, um, the two surveyors that are working on this project, we are living together um, in an isolated unit. So we have been granted permission to work throughout the COVID pandemic by the government because we are not interacting with anybody else. We're in field housing and the work that we're doing is remote enough because we're just going out to rural locations, even though we are outside, um, there's no interaction with um, other people. So we can get into a little bit of natural history and the habitats. Um, burrowing owls are the only raptors that live underground. Um, and so because of this, they need very loose 
well draining soils, um, usually sandy soils. Um, and in Florida, burrowing owls will actually excavate their own burrows. Um, out west, they primarily rely on other animals' burrows um, in order to nest. So they might be using prairie dog burrows or gopher tortoise burrows, but out in Florida, they'll actually dig their own burrows. Um, these burrows are anywhere from five to 12 feet in length, and they can be as far as three feet under the ground. Um, their habitat primarily, they're burrowing in low grassland and prairie habitats. Um, however, they have adapted to urban habitats as well. Um, they have started using um, vacant lots, grassy fields, um, that kind of thing, airports in order to create burrows. Um, so some other habitat features, they do need uh, good visibility, so fence posts, um, perches, stakes, those kinds of things, give them a much better vantage to detect predators, to search for prey, that kind of thing. Um, and they are one of the few diurnal species of owls, like snowy owls. Um, so they are active and hunt during the day. Um, they are most active right after sunrise. Um, and when they hunt, they're going after small mammals, they're going after reptiles and amphibians and insects. Um, you can see at the bottom photo there, a owl that has um, some frog legs, some tasty frog legs that he caught. So um, on average, they are living about six to eight years in the wild. So owls may use their nests all year round, but they're primarily, or sorry, their burrows all year round, but they're primarily using it for nesting during uh, March to June. So that's the peak uh, nesting season. There are nests that um, do occur outside of this time frame because Florida is very hot and they are residential here. They can nest during other times of the year, but that is the peak season. Um, so during, they'll usually, uh, nest in either an isolated pair or a small colony where there'll be several independent family groups that are all in the similar region. Um, they also sometimes decorate their nests. Um, so basically they'll collect items to scatter around the entrance. And it's not entirely sure why they do this because um, you'll see that there'll be both a mated pair already there. So it's not presumed to attract a mate. Um, but if you were wondering where all the toilet paper was going during the COVID pandemic, you can see on the bottom photo there that burrowing owl has taken a lot of it to decorate its nest with. Um, so during the nesting season, they will lay a few, approximately two to 12 eggs. Um, they're incubating these eggs for about four weeks. And then once the chicks hatch, um, they only emerge after another two weeks. Uh, and then after that, it takes them another six weeks before they're fully flighted. And then they leave the burrow approximately 30 to 60 days after that to find their own area. So what am I doing with burrowing owls? So we mentioned previously, I'm working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission um, in, in order to assist with data collection and research. So um, the FWC has determined that uh, these owls need further research. Um, they were classified as a threatened species in Florida in 2016. And this is primarily due to the loss of native prairie habitat um, in combination with the lack of natural habitat protection and the unknown status of rural populations of burrowing owls. So there are additional threats. Um, feral and invasive animals such as cats and green iguanas in Florida. Um, insecticide and rodenticide use on their food sources and um, car and tractors collisions in urban and agricultural areas also pose a threat um, but the extent of this is unknown so um, but urban population owls have been well studied um, and are being tracked by several independent organizations but rural population statuses are currently unknown um, there have, there was, the last formal study that has been done was over two decades ago to try to analyze the condition of the urban pop, or sorry, the rural population. Um, so hopefully some of the research we're doing now will help to fill in the gaps that we have and set a baseline for future conservation efforts. Um, so the two primary objectives 
um, are twofold. The first is that I'm working to help quantify population abundance, so the number of rural burrowing owls, and what habitats they're using, um, the qualities of the habitats. Um, the second objective is that we've also been assisting with is to determine the use and success of artificial starter burrows, which I'll get into a little bit more later. So with the rural owls, um, this proposal actually started uh, two years before I even got here. So the setup before um, I got here was to create a um, model to randomly distribute points in GIS, which is a spatial modeling software online. Um, and the points were distributed randomly throughout the state of Florida based on areas that had either previous detections of owls or that was um, categorized as suitable habitat based on a land habitat feature. Um, so this is actually the second year of surveying. Last year they had a whole different set of points than what you see up there on the map. Um, and they did all of those points. And then this year when my coworker Eden and I came in, um, we got a whole new set of points to come in and survey. Um, so for our our work, we're surveying during the breeding season, since this is the primary season um, for uh, the best ability to detect owls. Um, so we're going out to these points, and what we do is we, from the side of the road, conduct a six-minute point count. Um, so we are scanning and scoping the area for six minutes, and we're doing these primary surveys between sunrise and 10 a.m. So we're usually up at about 5 a.m. in order to drive out to our first survey point to get there by sunrise. Um, after 10 a.m., we're doing opportunistic surveys. So we are conducting surveys in areas that we believe are good habitat, um, even if there's no point specifically for it on the map, um, just to help increase detectability. Um, some of the, and then some of the points we'll revisit two to three to four more times um, just to improve detectability and also to account for variability in a statistical analysis that will be run later. So I do, oops, go back. I do want to show you some of the equipment that I use. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a minute here so that I can show you some of the equipment we use out in the field. Um, so the first two pieces are the handy dandy binoculars that we use and our scope. So mounted here on a tripod, which this is what allows us to scan the environment for six minutes. Um, and then we're also taking um, habitat measurements. So we measure at every location the temperature. This little device here is called a Kestrel. It's used to measure wind and temperature. So um, you can see Temperature is measured in Celsius. We're taking all of our um, uh, units in metric. All of the data is being measured in metric just to be standardized. Um, so currently inside of our uh, little humble abode here, it's 26 degrees Celsius, which is about uh, uh, 72 Fahrenheit, a little bit less than that, a little bit more than that, sorry. And then it also measures wind speed using this little circular part up top here. So if I blow, you can see the wind speed increases there. So it helps us to measure the wind speed. Um, if we do detect an owl, there's a couple of other measurements we take as well. So one of them is counting the number of owls that we see, simply, um, and counting the number of nests that we see. Um, we also will count the, or will uh, record behaviors that we observe. And then we try to to detect the exact location of the burrow itself using compass bearing. So we have a compass, um, pretty standard. You point it, you point the little red arrow so that it lines up with the red, the other red arrow inside. And then you face yourself towards the direction of the owl and you measure the degrees around the edge. The other thing we use is the range finder. So this is a little device that allows you to measure distance. Um, and so inside of it, it has a laser. And when you hit it on, unfortunately, you can't see from uh, the webcam. But when you look through the little eyepiece, there's a little laser in there that you can point at the uh, site that you want to measure. And when you hit the button on the top, it'll give you the distance um, from yourself to that point. So we can use that to um, map exactly where the burrow location is 
populations and not just where we are surveying from. So it's really easy. That's most of the equipment that we're using. So there's really not too much to it. Um, a majority of it um, is pretty straightforward. And it's just making sure that we're standing, following a standardized protocol. So I have a challenge for everybody watching, actually. I'm going to go back to sharing my PowerPoint here. Um, I want you all to help me identify owls. Um, so I have some photos here and you can leave the guesses of which numbers you think are owls in the comments if you want. Um, and I'll go through a couple of the ID characteristics that we use to help us ID owls as we do this. So the first is we use relative size and shape. So um, a burrowing owl is smaller than a crow, but it's going to be bigger than something like a robin, like a songbird, like a robin. They also, what, they're shaped like what I like to say a snowman shape. So they've got this really big, round, bulky body and this uh, round, big head that sits on top. Um, and they're also, they're very vertical. So they stand very statuesque and vertically upwards. Um, and they have short tails. So those are a few of the physiological characteristics. Um, for coloration, they have a um, mottled brown and white pattern on on their head and their body. Um, they also um, have yellowish eyes, which can differ for the um, urban owls, but for the rural owls specifically, you'll see yellow eyes. Lastly, we're going off of also behavior, which unfortunately you can't see from the photos here, um, but burrowing owls tend to be pretty still. They're not jumping or hopping along like a lot of birds you'll see on grasslands do. Um, and they also fly with stiffer and slower wing beats. So they're not flying with really frantic quick flaps. Um, so if everybody is ready, I'm going to reveal which ones are burrowing owls. So we have numbers one, four, and seven here are burrowing owls. Um, you can see one and four demonstrate really well that kind of vertical stance with the um, round bulky body, the multi, the sorry, mottled brown and white pattern. Um, but number seven is mostly what we're seeing in the field. So when we get out there, most of the time um, you see an owl over 100 meters away. Um, and we usually are identifying owls in those cases with behavior components too. So it's very um, just from using the scope and binoculars to tell that that would be an owl without some additional information usually. And usually that comes down to behavior. Um, and then out of, for anybody who's curious, number two, three, five, and six are a couple of other species that we often encounter out in the field. So number two is a red-shouldered hawk, three is a bald eagle, five is an eastern meadowlark, which has a very, very pretty sound in the morning, um, and number six is a kestrel. Um, so what have we found so far? Um, so to date, we found approximately 60 rural owls um, since we started in March, uh, what we found are a couple of really large hotspots um, and then additional clusters and a couple of individual spots along the way too. So you can see that there are two uh, hotspots that have um, 20 and 27, 21 and 27 uh, birds respectively. So these occurred on cattle pasture and agricultural land that we were fortunate enough to gain access to by um, contacting and working with private landowners. Um, and so we don't know the exact reasonings just yet as to why burrowing owls are clustering specifically in these regions. Um, however, some of the habitat features that we have found are that the um, land has short grasses and the short grasses aren't being mowed but they're being grazed on by cattle which is what's keeping them short. Um, they have a lot of posts and fen fences and things to perch on for the owls to get better advantages and um, they have a very sandy soil that's low in clay content um, and they tend to be away from large human aggregations. So they are away from major, major highways um, and large towns where there are houses right next to each other and around. We have found several smaller clusters 
um, and several points of only one to two individuals that are also on the map there. Um, and these have also been found on cattle pasture and on some regional airports. So they seem to like skydiving ranches apparently quite a bit. Um, when we first see the owls, we are most um, often detecting them perching on top of or near their burrow. And sometimes we're observing behaviors like preening, um, foraging, or digging. I do have a quick video here that I want to share with you um, of a burrowing owl digging. This was recorded by my coworker Eden. Um, so you can see the uh, one owl standing statuesque right on top of his burrow and then you can see these little tufts of sand getting kicked up out of a hole in the burrow by the mate that is helping to uh, uh, maintain keep maintenance. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint here. All right, so um, but we're not only working with the urban owls. We have got, or sorry, the rural owls. We have gotten to work a little bit with the urban owls too. Um, so a little bit about rural, uh, excuse me, urban owl background. Um, we have found the urban owl population has doubled over the past five years. So their colonies are currently expanding. They do show physiological and behavioral differences to their rural counterparts. So primarily um, physiological differences, they are running genetics and they found some um, genetic components that show that they, the populations are um, slightly isolated. They also, you can see in that top photo there, um, they have different eye colors. So um, they have chicks that are born with either yellow eyes or brown eyes or some sort of spectrum in between. Um, so a lot of urban owls do have different color eyes. Um, the behavioral differences often are mostly in conjunction with humans. So urban owls are much less um, skitch of humans. You can drive on a street right next to them five meters away and they won't react unlike the rural owls. Um, so they seem to tolerate how, uh, human disturbance a lot better. Um, they're often found on vacant property lots. Um, they're also found on front lawns, people's front lawns, and on airports in the area. Um, occasionally also golf courses too, and other areas that maintain low grass levels. Um, however, there's concern that even though the population is currently growing, um, eventually there will be a carrying capacity that will stabilize out the population. And if there's too much development and construction that goes on in urban areas of vacant lots, that could potentially destroy some of the habitat that rural owls are burrowing on in urban areas. So part of the research has been to implement what are called um, uh, artificial starter burrows. And artificial starter burrows Burrows are essentially man-made burrows that are implanted into the ground, usually with piping of some sort. Um, and it's just uh, facilitating the owl to burrow um, in an area that it might not otherwise have considered burrowing in. So it's helping to attract it to a new area. Um, and then so far, these burrows have been placed in Cape Coral, Marco, Iwer, Marco Island, and Broward counties uh, throughout Florida. And they're useful for a couple of different research reasons. The first is to help determine space and density requirements for breeding. So they can strategically place the artificial starter burrows um, in a pattern to help figure out um, what density requirements are needed. And then the um, other reason is for the ability to relocate owls. So um, if there's a property that's going to be developed and there are owls located there, um, they can get permission to try to relocate the owls and so using starter burrows to help um, successfully restart um, a burrowing owl nest uh, is being worked on right now. So what we found is we surveyed 19 starter burrows in about mid-March and we found 11 of them had owls present, um, either a single owl or a pair of two. We didn't have any fledglings at the time, it was still a little early in the season. 
Um, and we also had two sites that were probable starter borough candidates. So we found, uh, even though we didn't find any owls at the sites, we found active signs of use. So we found the decorations that they normally put scattered around the entrance. We found pellets that they'll cough up. We found feces, we found animal bones, things like that. So it seemed like they were being actively used, even though we didn't spot the owls there. So it is still um, good to note that probability. So with all of this research, where do we go from here? Um, so the main future goals is that we do need more research, especially on the rural populations. Um, the data that we've collected so far is great to help determine a statewide population abundance, which after it's run through all of the statistical analyses um, and data collection will be hopefully completed by the end of 2021. Um, so, uh, but there does need to be additional information collected about um, specific features of the habitat. So we're getting a general sense right now by going out to all these different locations, but the exact qualities of the habitat are very difficult to study when we're doing such a wide range survey. Um, so the other thing is the ability to use uh, starter burrows to mitigate habitat at loss in urban areas um, and potentially rural areas. So if we find that starter burrows are very successful, this can definitely be used to encourage burrowing owls to move to areas that can be deemed um, conservation areas or areas that are not going to be developed anytime soon. So the long-term thing that we're looking at is to make sure and ensure that populations are stable or increasing over the course of the next 10 years. Um, so because we don't know the current status of rural owls, we don't know whether or not they're increasing or decreasing in population numbers, um, but we do definitely want to make sure that um, there is habitat conserved, not only for them, but for other animals that they share similar habitat with. So I want to uh, thank the people involved in this project with me, Juan and Eden, and then also thank you, Jamie and JF, for having me here um, and the organizations that have really helped facilitate this project. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation here. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. All right. I don't think I was muted. All right. <laughs> okay. so it was awesome. And I think, um, man, what wonderful work you're doing. And I think JF um, is going to take some questions from the audience. Absolutely. So thanks so much, Joey. That was very great. And we had a bunch of nice questions. First of all, I want to mention that all the stuff, the, the equipment you're using for uh, the surveys seems to be just perfect for social distancing. I mean, the scope, binoculars, the laser for the measure. I mean, this is just great. Uh, someone, someone asked, um, are you recording the data just manually in a, in a notebook or uh, you're entering all that in a tablet or something? Um, that's a great question. So I um, can sh show you guys here. It's going to make me re-sign into it. But we are, we're using a phone. We're, we're literally just using a simple phone in order to collect the data. And we're using SRI's collection. So um, SRI is the company that produces ArcGIS, which is the system that all the points were produced with, all the survey points. And so we use their collector app to um, record our data. So all the points um, appear up on the map and we can press this little button and it pops up. It's going to be very difficult to see with this screen, um, but it pops up all of the information that we're supposed to be inputting. So it pops up um, questions like the total number of observed the number of adults, the number of burrows, um, the location of where the owls were in relativity to the burrow, um, any behavioral characteristics, any calls they make, um, the method that we use to detect them, the weather, the temperature that we talked about before, any visual barriers we have. So we often come across barriers such as um, vegetation, construction, and then later in the day, heat haze. So the reason we only survey until 10 a.m. is because after that, the heat haze gets really bad and detectability drops quite significantly. Um, so, and then the duration and noise level, other things like that, that might impact the survey. So we're using uh, the SRI collector app in order to collect all this data on a phone. All right, excellent. Good, good mm -hmm. answer. Uh, another question related to the burrows themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Are all the burrows actually nests? 
at some point in the year or some of them are used just as like a resting place or a hiding place? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, certain burrows are used as supplementary burrows. Um, it's not uncommon for a um, pairing of owls or a single owl to have multiple burrows around it. Um, and one of them will be a primary burrow that is often used for nesting, and the additional burrows will be backup burrows in case something either happens and that the primary burrows collapse, um, or in case they simply just need, like you said, resting. Um, they can use their burrows all year round, so there are um, a section of owls that will use their uh, burrows during the wintering period, even though it's not mating season. However, there's also a section of owls that will go off and they're not entirely sure where or why, but they will leave the burrows behind. Um, so there is that discrepancy there, but they do have supplementary burrows often around them that they're sharing, yeah. All right, all right, thanks. Is there any um, other animals using the burrows that might be yeah. initial? I mean, like, are they fighting with ants or um, I don't know what, it, what other species might be competing with the, the, the owls? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what we've seen so far is um, not too much in terms of other animals around the area. Um, we haven't really found any other uh, species that, um, other than a couple, that have taken over burrowing owl burrows. So the exceptions to this is um, I have seen gopher tortoises been using burrowing owl burrows because they also live underground. They also can dig their own burrows. Um, so they'll often, and likewise, burrowing owls will sometimes take over gopher tortoise burrows. So it goes both ways. Um, the other thing that I found, which was very surprising, um, but was one of my uh, favorite moments, was I found a um, snake in one of a, an, an old historic burrowing owl burrow. So um, when I got there, the burrow itself was very close to the road. I could see it from the road. I was able to walk out to it and there was actually a snake inside of it. So um, we don't know whether or not that snake was present uh, if when there were owls there or if it came in between the, in, during the winter season um, because the last time owls had been recorded was the year before there. Um, so there is a little bit of swap and exchange use with some of these burrows, which is, is fun to see. But, but then, so from your observation, it seems to be mentioning a somewhat stable or, a, I mean, maybe increasing population in Florida, which yeah. seems to be contrasting with some other places west of the country. And a good mm -hmm. friend and colleague of us, uh, David Johnson, is studying borrowing owls in Oregon uh, with the Global Owl Project. And over mm -hmm. there, it seems, I don't know if the ground is more compact, but mm -hmm. the owls actually need other species to dig holes for them to use, such as badgers yeah. or others. And then mm -hmm. they would um, benefit a lot from human artificial burrows. But your yeah. video was so cute showing the owls being mm -hmm. able to dig their own burrow. Do you think that affects the population trend in Florida? Um, yes, I definitely think that it um, allows them to facilitate new environments like the urban environments that they otherwise wouldn't necessarily be able to facilitate um, because you're not getting as many other species that are potentially digging burrows in an urban environment. So they're coming in and digging these burrows for themselves. So they're able to utilize habitats that otherwise they probably wouldn't be able to utilize um, because of that. So um, like your friend said, um, my coworker Eden actually lives in Colorado, and so the burrowing owls that she sees out there are all owls that use prairie dog um, habitat for the most part. Um, and so they need that uh, additional species to facilitate their burrowing and nesting dynamics. But out here, um, I do believe that it has helped uh, stabilize and increase urban owl populations, definitely. All right. Is, um any new burrows will get uh, automatically protected, legally protected, or is it how, how's the situation in Florida? Um, so yeah, that's a great question. I can show you really quickly um, one of the um, slides that I have on my PowerPoint. So because there are threatened species, let's go back here to, here we go. Uh, because there are threatened species, they do receive um, protection. So um, you can see here that any known burrowing owl location in an urban habitat has what's called a T-post and a sign there 
that designates that it's a protected site and a protected animal. So any type of harassment of owls, any type of destruction of their nest, um, any collapsing intentionally or unintentionally of a burrow is technically a crime. Um, and this is primarily during the breeding season, um, especially because there could be um, fledglings present. Um, so during the non-breeding season, it is possible to obtain a permit to um, collapse the burrow um, potentially for construction. Um, but in order to obtain that permit, they have somebody come out to make sure that the burrow isn't actively being used during that non-breeding season. Um, and if that's the case, there is a um, there is a price that they have to pay, there is money that they have to pay in order to um, assist with either the relocation of burrowing owls or the implementation and starter of a new burrow um, for that site, so. All right, thanks. Thanks for, for your nice answer. Um, there are several questions now <laughs> with, uh, on, the, on the blog. So I'm trying to hit uh, as many as I can, but Jamie just cut me off if, if we're running out of time. One of the questions that was asked was, um, are there any banded burrowing owls in Florida? And if yes, um, what are you guys uh, noticing? Are you seeing movement? Are you getting reports and, and all of that? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, we have had some burrowing owls that were banded in the urban areas. There are no rural owls that we've encountered that were banded in the rural owl in the areas that we've been to. Um, we're primarily focusing on or trying to focus on rural areas that have not been explored before um, or that are not being monitored. But however, in the urban areas, um, we have had several banded individuals that um, I've reached out to the individuals that are tracking them. One of the ones that we found moved from Cape Coral um, to Marco Island. Um, so right there along the uh, western coast of Florida, but to two different um, kind of hot spots of burrowing owls in urban areas. Um, and during that conversation, he also relayed that they did have a burrowing owl that moved from Cape Coral on the kind of central uh, western um, seaboard of Florida down to Miami. Um, so it did that kind of across Florida trip. Um, and the only reason why they know this stuff is because of, of the bands. So the um, bands in the urban populations are primarily being done by Autobahn of the Western Everglades. Um, they're the group that's primarily tracking the urban owl populations out there. Um, and then there's also volunteers and assistants that go out and check up on these owls. So, yeah. All right, well, th yeah, th thanks very much. Any indication that uh, some owls from, from Florida could go west of Florida, like Texas or, or mm -hmm. beyond, or the reverse, any owls appearing in Florida could be coming from outside of Florida? Um, that's a great question. We don't know the extent of um, isolation that these owls have or extension. We do know that there have been sightings in um, southern Georgia. So we do know that they are going out a little bit. You also see owls down in um, uh, Puerto Rico and a little bit throughout the Caribbean too. So there is some travel. Um, we don't know the extent, um, or at least I haven't found anything about the exact extent of um, owl movements from Florida elsewhere. Um, I'm not entirely sure about movements into Florida. Um, I think it's a largely area of unknown uh, research that would definitely, that we would definitely benefit from, so. All right, um, I think another one, and until, until Jamie cuts me off, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna keep asking some questions. Um, question regarding the burrows themselves, are, mm -hmm. is there only one entrance to the whole thing or there's like an exit, an entrance? And uh, what was the other one? Uh, are the, um, the adults pairing for life or do they uh, rotate with partners uh, annually? Um, great questions. So to get to the first one, there's usually just one entrance. Um, and it'll go down into the ground. Um, however, with uh, supplementary burrows, that can sometimes complicate things. So um, I do believe on occasion there's been, um, there'll be supplementary burrows that connect to the, the primary burrow. Um, but for the most part, there's just one main entrance. Um, and then for mating, 
Um, they, for this, they do mate for life primarily. However, with a lot of bird species, there is extra pair copulations. Um, so basically meaning that there will be individuals that um, go have relations with other individuals, um, especially if it's in a larger colony potentially. Um, but for the mating season, um, they're staying with a single um, primary, uh, it's a single primary couple that stays together, so yeah. All right, maybe one last uh, one that I had that I wanted to ask was um, how can people help? People in Florida, but people elsewhere, how can we help the burrowing out? Um, that's a great question. So I added a little bit of a, a slide here at the end just to address this question because I mean, some people might have it. So let's share this slide. Um, so there's a couple of different things. So if you're in areas with burrowing owls, um, specifically if you're in Florida, there's a great organization group called Owl Watch with Audubon of the Western Everglades. And it's a volunteer group that goes out and monitors um, all known, excuse me, um, all known urban burrowing owl locations. And they help facilitate documentation of nestlings, how many they're seeing. They also go out and they help mow and keep the grasses at a particular level um, without disruption to the owls or collapsing of the burrows. So they're specially trained um, to make sure that the owls stay safe. So you can volunteer with organizations like this. Um, you can also install your own starter burrow. Um, there is some movement to try to have people put them in their front lawns a little bit just to see um, how successful that can be. Um, and then of course, donating to a conservation organization that's doing this kind of research can always uh, help benefit them. Um, if you're not in Florida specifically, but you are in an area that has burrowing owls, um, you, or any area for that matter, check wildlife uh, that might be nesting in your lawn. So there's other species other than burrowing owls that use lawns for their nests, uh, species like rabbits, so anytime you're mowing or landscaping your land at all, um, moving a large vehicle across um, your land, um, double check for wildlife that might be uh, using that land for nesting or burrowing. Um, and additionally, reduction or implementation of um, di uh, more natural pesticide, insecticide, and rodenticide use. Um, because burrowing owls, as we know, are feeding on insects a lot. They're feeding on small mammals like mice and voles a lot. So the use of rodenticides and insecticides when they get into the animal can then bioaccumulate within the owls. Um, and then lastly is something as simple as pollution. So we see that owls often use decorations around their, their nests. When you see a burrowing owl burrow in the rural areas, you see a lot of um, natural things like grasses that they use. You see um, dung of, of other animals actually that they'll use. When you get to the more urban areas, you'll see other things like bits of plastic. You saw the toilet paper from before. Um, so they're using much different materials that could potentially be harmful or dangerous. So those are the small ways that you can make an impact on not only burrowing owls, but some other wildlife too. Zoe, right. thank you so much. Thank you, JF. Did you have another comment, JF? No, I was about to give you the microphone back. <laughs> All right. Um, both, great job to both of you. And Zoe, what a fantastic presentation. You're doing great work. and. We really enjoyed learning about it, so thank you so much. Uh, final question for you, Zoe, because we had so many wonderful questions come in, and unfortunately, we don't always have time to answer all the questions. If people have more questions that weren't answered today or they want to get updates on your project, mm -hmm. um, is there a website that they can uh, contact through your research station, or what's the best way to do that? Um, so they're absolutely welcome to email me. Um, I can, I don't know if there's a way to put up my email at all, but um the email is in the chat maybe yeah there we go that would be great i can write it here um it's zoe venerbo at myfwc.com so my first name last name at myfwc.com um the current research is still in its very um early stages because we're still in data collection so there won't be unfortunately a final report until almost the end of 2021 um but if they're very interested, they can look for updates on that that will be um, included on the governmental websites. Um, if they want additional updates about urban owl populations, 
um, they can check out on Facebook. There's the Burrowing Owls of Marco Island um, Facebook group, which is a great resource. They do live stream all of the owls that are on their island um, and just simply googling um, burrowing owls in Florida you'll come up with quite a number of websites that um, talk about the research going on so wonderful Zoe thank you so much um, and thank you to all of our audience for joining us today we really appreciate it I also have to mention that today happens to be Raptorthon at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and my colleague Ridgetop Rachel is the driving force behind Raptorthon today. She's gonna to be making posts on our Facebook throughout the day of the different birds uh, and raptor sightings she's seen from her backyard and she's inviting everyone to participate. And on any of her Facebook posts, she's inviting you to share what uh, bird species you are seeing from your backyard. And of course, donations are always appreciated for Raptorthon. Um, so I just wanna mention as well, some other upcoming virtual programming we have. On Wednesday, May 13th, at 1 o'clock p.m., we have Citizen Science and You. On Friday, May 15th, at 4 o'clock p.m., we have Raptor ID for Beginners. On Wednesday, May 20th, at 1 o'clock p.m., we have Trapping and Tracking. And on Friday, May 22nd, at 4 o'clock p.m., we have Chasing Broadwings from Pennsylvania to Peru. So we hope to see everyone again soon. Thanks again so much, Zoe. Thank you, JF. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.